So hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to my talk today. Um, again, you know, the topic that I'll be talking about is on MQTT. Uh, if you're familiar with it, it, tends, it, it stands for Message Queuing Telemetry Transport. And as such, it is actually a protocol uh, designed for doing Internet of Things. Um, if you're familiar with it, it has become quite uh, popular uh, in the past, I'd say, since it started uh, switching gear, so to speak, it's become quite popular uh, or increasing popularity. So with that, let me start today's talk. Okay, let me, I have to switch myself uh, a bit uh, smaller so I won't block the uh, the presentation slides. So, um, and in fact, too, I will be sharing with you this slide deck and uh, and uh, you should be able to also get it. But if you're interested, oh, I, I thought I already uh, share with you a bitly link, but uh, don't worry about it. I will be sharing that with you um, afterwards, too. So, so who is Mary Grigleski? I'm a senior. And, and actually, let me first of all say that um, I realized that the time when I sub was submitting the, the uh, proposal to this conference, I was still with a company called HiveMQ. And so I submitted to this conference uh, on a topic that I was doing, you know, previously, but I'm still talking about MQTT2. And then since then, I've changed and now I'm at um, uh, data stacks. So I wanted to kind of point out, I'm still doing uh, a streaming type of uh, system, streaming platform, but not uh, specifically for like MQTT that I did at HiveMQ. So anyway, let me then introduce myself again here. Uh, it's a bit new information. I, I thought I updated it, but I guess I didn't. So I apologize for that. So I'm a senior developer advocate at Datastax. And this is a company that's based in California, although it is uh, global, pretty much. We have customers now in, you know, a large part of Europe, as as well as I believe also we have in Japan now, slowly getting to Asia. Um, so it, it's getting to be a global company. Anyway, so the company is the one that makes, um, uh, they don't make it, but uh, we support open source software. So Cassandra um, is the one manage Cassandra, and I'm on the streaming team in which I'm actually now working with Apache Pulsar. So Pulsar too, you can also use it to handle like MQTT, IoT type of uh, messaging scenario. But today the talk though is on specifically on, on the MQTT protocol. So, okay, so that's that. And previously, I was with IBM. And in fact, last year when I spoke here at Berlin Buzzwords, I, I was uh, speaking with Fabio uh, Teritico. At the time, we were working on reactive technology. So, um, so I was with IBM and I was advocating for Java, for open source, uh, WebSphere, uh, reactive technology. So that was me uh, previously. And then I'm based in Chicago. I'm also the president of the Chicago Java Users Group. And also, I help out too with a couple of uh, IBM sponsored meetups in Chicago. Previously, I have uh, experience as a developer, as a software engineer for over 20 years uh, in Java specifically too. And uh, so I've worked in a variety of systems and I understand the, the I, perhaps the problems that you face every day. And uh, so if you'd like to get in touch, to stay in touch with me, which I would very much like to invite you to stay in touch, uh, here are all the links how as to how you can get a hold of me. But again, I'll be sharing this uh, towards the end of this slide deck and also be sharing the slide deck with you so and with that let me start uh, this one actually oh this one too is just another slide deck to explain myself at, at my current company and by the way too i'm also a java champion now i uh, became one uh last year late last year so um and then here are all the different things i've been working with and my you know, specific interests have always been in distributed systems, distributed messaging type of uh, kind of computing uh, thing that, that I like about. So, okay, so today's agenda, let me uh, kind of step through so then you have an idea. So first of all, I want to touch on the IoT stack. And as such, you know, this talk too is, is pretty much uh, for anybody who's new to MQTT. So I would like to do an introduction to the internet, the internet of things, the stack, to kind of get all of us uh, start on the same page. So pardon me if you're already familiar with it, and then I, it may be a bit of a repeat for some of you. And so um, after this, then I will introduce and kind of drill down into MQTT. 
and then giving you a brief history of it, and then also uh, touch on the little bit of the open standard that it is um, being supported uh, at the Oasis uh, Open Source uh, Foundation. Oasis is a very much a community-driven protocol. And then I'll get into MQTT, uh, the older version, which is 3.1.1 features, uh, some of these features uh, that are still widely used. In, in fact, it forms the basis of this MQTT protocol. And then in M MQTT 5.0 is a newer version of the protocol that uh, became, you know, kind of uh, or got released in 2018. So it's a more recent version that supports a lot of the cloud native uh, types of features. And then I'll bring in some use cases for MQTT. And then also uh, just bring up a couple of alternative proto protocols that you can use if you don't want to use MQTT. And then also show you, again, highlight uh, some of the benefits and strengths of MQTT for IoT messaging. And then a, a quick demo after that. So, and that's my agenda. So let me start. So, um, let's say, you know, let's look at this, you know, IoT from 30,000 feet above, you know, a, a bit of an overview, because I feel there's an, like an increased understanding to, of uh, Internet of Things, because it almost seems like everybody's talking about IoT, IoT. And then, of course, too, for me, when I first uh, was working for HiveMQ uh, briefly, and uh, when I first started, too, I was, I was thinking more like IoT as basically devices uh, dealing with components and small devices, for example, like Arduino, uh, Raspberry Pi, and sure enough, you can use those small devices to collect data from Internet of Things. But the thing is that Internet of Things refers to essentially everything, right, on the Internet. Anything that's connected can be considered an Internet of Things. You know, it's just things is a very general term. And um, so all your sensors, your actuators, you know, temperature gauge and all these other kind of devices that you try to measure something, the speedometer, for example, it can be connected as well. There are also things like connected cars, all of these, you know, so I, my, you know, my, my understanding at first too was a bit limited, thinking that those are the only things that are being referred to as Internet of Things and better device. However, as I'm kind of studying more, you know, getting into it, then I realized, okay, in order for these devices to be able to communicate, you know, then you re rely on communication protocols, protocols that are standardized. So then, you know, there are different devices that are qualified for different types of protocols. So of which then MQTT is one. MQTT stands for message queuing telemetry transport. And um, and then there are other protocols, for example, like uh, CoAP, which is constrained application protocol, AMQP, which is actually used by M uh, RabbitMQ. If you are into like uh, messaging, right, you may be familiar with RabbitMQ. It seems to be a pretty popular uh, protocol for application level uh, messaging, right? And then there's also DDS, which is distributed data services. XMPP is an XML-based type of protocol that are catered more for like chat, uh, internet chat type. You know, that's how it was born with, more XML-based. And then there are also other protocols like IPv4. So sometimes I got questioned too, like why do you group them all together on this layer? Because I just want to highlight that these are communication protocol protocols. I'm kind of grouping the ISO seven layers of, of communication protocols specifically into one layer in here. As you can see, IoT stack, you know, as I'm introducing to you, it actually covers everything, right? And so like if you travel up the stack, you'll see more. But like I said, let me kind of finish up. Then there's also on this communication protocol, you can be relying on IP uh, version four or IPv6. And then there's also for uh, uh, six low uh, pan, which is the low powered uh, IPv6 version. And then there's also Bluetooth, which is has its own communication stack of itself, kind of like the IO, uh, the the ISO, the the seven layer or the OSI, Open Systems Interconnect Seven Layers Communication Protocol. But Bluetooth, as some of you may know, has its own way of communicating that mimic the seven layers, but not exactly. It has just its own way uh, and it's a very short range. And then there's also GSM and Modbus and BACnet, all of these other things that are, some of them are catered for more factory type of use to, uh, or machine, right? On, on that large scale, like industrial machine level as well. And some of you too might also have heard of Sparkplug too. So that's also kind of another 
kind of a, a communication kind of protocol that's kind of more application layer that's kind of supports IoT type of uh, industrial messaging too. Okay, so if we kind of go beyond the communication protocol, then we get into kind of the core platform. So beyond just the kind of communication side, right? You get into the core platform that that kind of expands, you know, into just the messaging part. For example, IoT messaging middleware that supports more capability of just the communication protocol, which actually MQTT or HiveMQ, MQTT, uh, the broker also support too. It's more like a broker level, the middleware side now. And then there's also protocol gateway, data aggregation, data storage and filter, all of these things. These are more core platform. Now, if you travel still up to, then it gets into the analytics platform. And that's where too, initially, when I got into IoT, I realized, okay, there are some meetup groups that are actually called AI and machine learning group, and they are studying IoT. I was like, what does it have to do with it? Yes, of course, there are plenty of things. It's basically taking the data from the IoT layer, collecting all of the data and making sense out of it, analyzing it and responding to it, generating reports, you know, analysis of these uh, messages, really start to make, essentially make sense of the data that you're being collected. That's pretty much on the analytics level, right? And machine learning, stream processing. And then if you still kind of go up further, it'll be the cognitive level, which is the AI, voice recognition, gestures, interactions, and kind of really add further kind of value to the data you've collected. And then if you go all the way up, then there's more solutions layer. Now, how many of us, right, these days will have a consumer type of uh, devices, right, that are, say, you know, your, um, uh, you know, kind of Apple Watch or something that is uh, kind of sensing how many, you know, kind of how many miles you walk every day or run every day, all of these kind of mobility, lifestyle, entertainment, all of these. So these are all kind of powered, you know, by all of these devices that are underneath and making sense out of the world that we live in. And there are enterprise level of solutions, right? Solutioning like in marketing sales, business, all of these things. And then also like industrial, uh, without saying, right, there's automated cars, uh, connected cars, manufacturing, all of these things. So so these are really the the the, the, the internet of things uh, stack that I call it. And as you can see, it covers everything. Your computer, your laptop is also an internet of things. So pretty exciting stuff. So let's kind of now get into MQTT. So what is MQTT? So again, you know, if you look, we call back that previous slide is really on the communication protocol la layer. That's a standard, right, for kind of communicating. It is a standard binary publish subscribe messaging protocol that's designed for fast and reliable data transport between devices, right? Especially the, the, the core piece of it is that it allows for conditions that are very constrained. You know, you don't have as much network bandwidth, um, very small devices, small memory footprints, all of these things. So that's actually the, 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 the strength of MQTT is for these constrained type of conditions uh, where your devices live. And um, <clears throat> so limited battery power, uh, limited bandwidth, which just I meant, just I just mentioned about those, and it's built on top of uh, TCP/IP. So on the commu communication kind of protocol layer is basically is on top of TCP/IP. So if you're familiar with the seven layers of OSI networking layer, it's basically is that layer that's on top of TCP/IP, which TCP/IP I think is a layer four protocol, right? So MQTT is the, the level up, like on top of it is the application la layer. And essentially too, it's ideal for internet of things. So if you can kind of see over here, I'm using an example, um, because of a pub sub type of messaging protocol, it relies on a broker. The broker is the agent that's basically receiving, uh, would be receiving the messages from the publisher and also then uh, kind of let subscribers subscribe to the messages. So it's sort of, you do need to rely or rely on the middle agent to kind of handle messaging for you. But that's also the beauty of it is that because of this approach, it allows for scalability really in large scale too. I'm not only talking about 100 messages, I'm talking about 100 you know, million messages per second, for example, something like that, that you can go up to. So as you can see, it is a, very efficient design type of protocol. Um, it does have is a bit of the limiting length too, but for what you need is actually very efficient and fast. 
Okay, so let's then get into a bit of the brief history of MQTT. It was actually invented in 1999 by Andy Stanford Clark at IBM and also Arlen Nipper at what was then Arcom and now is Cirrus Link. So the two of them came together because they were working on a pro project together. And back then in 1999, there was no concept yet, right, of Internet of Things. But yet they were like faced with this project. And the project is to was to design a protocol that could handle a very limited kind of operating environment uh, using satellite communication. And, um, but because of the network bandwidth and everything, um, basically the project is to measure uh, like oil pipelines, um, all of these uh, transport that is happening within the oil pipelines. Um, and again, through satellite. So limited bandwidth. And also at that time too, technology wasn't as advanced as it is now. It's like over what, 20 some years ago. So they, the two of them came together and thought, well, let's design a protocol to handle it because at the time, there wasn't any. So they came up and because Andy worked for, uh, is he's still actually at IBM too. When I was there, he, he's still there and he's still there now. So he's still with the uh, IBM. He's based in uh, the UK. And uh, so anyway, he and Arlen came together and designed this and they were using the name MQ because message Q, as you know, that came from IBM is the MQ series, the messaging queuing series. So they use MQ, but they knew to it, it wouldn't be like for the pure kind of messaging queuing type of uh, application uh, kind of needs. So they they designed specifically for oil pipelines and they use, they borrow the word MQ and then they add in telemetry uh, transport. So it's essentially too is is about some sort of communication, right? Tele, telemetry kind of uh, transport, right? So that's how they name it. So, but the thing is too, um, over time, you know, things have changed. So let's kind of take a look. So 1999, MQTT was invented, right, for oil pipeline monitoring. And then in 2010, MQTT 3.1 then opened up as royalty-free protocol. And then 2012, um, that's when Eclipse, uh, the foundation project, Mosquito 1.0 got released, you know, soon after the MQTT was invented. And that's Mosquito is all based on MQTT. And then very soon after that, a year or so, that would be uh, the, the birth of MQ, uh, Hive MQ, their broker, MQTT broker, and, and they name it 1.3 at that time, uh, version 1.3. And then also very soon after that, then, you know, the, the world getting caught on and realize that, well, there's a need now. There's more Internet of Things. We want to connect all of these devices together. And essentially, too, that's when um, they found, you know, the foundation of Oasis. This is uh, open source uh, foundation Oasis. The technical committee got formed in 2013. And then in 2014, they made some improvements to MQTT at that time was version three. So uh, they improve it and then uh, kind of label it 3.1.1 and it got officially released. And it's been actually been solidly running right since then. And a lot of the vendors are still uh, supporting um, perhaps just MQTT three. And the thing is too, with the internet, right? With the cloud and everything, then um, essentially too, the protocol has to um, kind of respond to all of the changes to the cloud native environment, all of these different concerns and clustering and scalability to address all of these things in the new world of cloud and cluster. Then 2018, MQTT5 was officially released. Um, and then Hive MQ2 immediately uh, released also support for MQTT5. And just a note about it is that Hive, Hive MQ plays a very important role in helping the growth of MQTT. There are already some features that was uh, designed even before MQTT5 got officially released. So you can tell too immediately, right, when MQTT5 became the reality, then MQ, uh, Hive MQ came out the version four came out already with MQTT5 support. And uh, they are kind of poised for kind of leading this, um, essentially leading this effort. Now, the MQTT technical committee, you may, you may wonder, just for your information, these are the nine companies that are currently involved. You know, they have voting rights. They have also uh, participants uh, doing commits, you know, and making strategy decisions on MQTT. So that includes HiveMQ, who I worked for briefly. And then there's also IBM still involved with this, Microsoft, uh, Software AG. Uh, is it Software AG? Yeah, that's why Software AG. And then EMQ, which is a base in China. 
China, and then uh, Cisco, ThingStream, uh, 9FX, and Solus. So these are like the nine uh, big companies that are leading this uh, effort. And okay, so just now, uh, let, let's give a very quick overview now. Um, so MQTT, you know, overview. It is an IoT messaging protocol, and it's got like three quality of service levels. So I'll get a bit into that, you know. Essentially, too, QoS is in very important, especially in messaging type of scenario. Think of the fact that messaging is not about the older style of doing things. You know, you need to communicate. You need to send messages. There are receivers. So there should be some way, right? If it's asynchronous, there needs to be some way of guaranteeing the messages gets delivered. So QoS is essentially a mechanism that's built into your broker to guarantee that you know, messages, once it's being sent to the broker, that no matter what, you know, there could be network disruption, there could be the nodes are going down, whatever it is, there has to be built-in mechanism to guarantee messages gets delivered no matter what. So that's what Q QoS levels are. So MQTT supports three different QoS levels. And then there are also uh, features such as retained messages that I will get into in a second. And then there's also very, it supports also stateful, like persistent sessions as well. So again, you know, this helps with the quality of service kind of delivery kind of level. You want to persist all of these messages and make sure it doesn't get lost. And also after delivery, you also have the, the ability to store them too. And then Overall, too, MQTT 3.0 is a binary protocol and very minimal overhead. And so that's why it favors, is really highly favored by uh, IoT type of uh, devices and communication. So let's get into some of the MQTT 3.1.1. Um, oops. Okay, there we go. Oops. I think I go, I go a little bit further. So <clears throat> let's kind of have to look again, right? So how does it work? Let's get a bit deeper. Essentially, too, for any kind of pop up type of scenario, you rely on a server or the broker in here. So on the right hand side, the broker um, and whoever communicates with the broker is called a client. You can be the one that's producing messages. So in such terms, it's called a producer. And then you can also be the one subscribing. You're not producing messages, but you're on the receiving side. So that's subscriber. And that's always this kind of, um, so to speak, like a handshake type of uh, approach, right, of pops up, in which your client, for example, first of all, you always do a connect, right? And you do a connect. And you connect to who? To the broker. So the broker will always be sending back, if it's successful, then it will always send back an acknowledgement. So it's called Connect ACK, right? And ACK stands for acknowledgement. And then say, likewise, if you're, once you have a connection, then you can be subscribing to it or publishing to it um, or subscribing from, right? I should say. And so if you subscribe, then it's subscribed to the to the broker. So the broker will have to acknowledge the fact that, okay, I, I receive your, your request to subscribe and I have to send you back an act. Likewise, if you're publishing, you're the one pu producing the messages and the broker gets it, it will have to send back an acknowledgement. So, so that's kind of like the very fundamental type of handshake kind of uh, way of doing things. And then on the right hand side, as you can see over here in an example, you can have a temperature sensor that's publishing uh, temperature kind of uh, measurement uh, to however much, you know, kind of frequency you set it to. Let's say every minute it published some uh, temperature to the broker. So once the broker receives it, well, at first too, there's no subscriber, then it's basically just going to sit there until somebody subscribes to it. Or if there's also a time to live type of uh, kind of parameter to it, it might be like, okay, every six, 60 seconds, if no subscription, I'm just going to remove the messages. You can do that too. So it depends on how the broker is being by. So, okay, let me go back then publish, subscribe. Then if you know, you have, you're interested in it, let's say a laptop, I'm subscribing to the, to this topic, right? You need to label your messages and then it's called a topic, right? That that's kind of like a channel. When I publish to it, I label it, call it a topic. And so, Whoever is interested to it will have to subscribe to the topic or to this um, channel. So, and then it can be mobile devices and can be any devices. So, <clears throat> okay, let me go to the next slide. Okay, here we go. Let's get a bit then into the packet level. How about that? So, okay, so now we talk about a connect packet, right? So on the packet level, I'm highlighting a couple of fields. You know, so you, you always need a client ID, 
a, a client session too uh, to indicate is it a client a, a clean session, right? And then also optional would be the security parameters. It's always suggested username, password, um, and then there there can be this thing called last will type of features. If it's turned on, then all of these fields would be filled in, like the topic name, the QoS level, quality of service level, the actual message payload, and also do you want to retain it, right? Some some kind of flag, and then also another um, parameter is called uh, keep alive. So that's the time to live kind of indicator. I can say 60 seconds, for example, in this particular example. So once I send this, I make a connection over to the broker, the broker will then acknowledge it. You know, if it receives it, acknowledge and sends back the session present um, uh, kind of a parameter and also a return code of zero indicating that I receive it okay. So this is kind of like a very basic connect and a connect con act to acknowledge from the broker side. And now this is the publish subscribe uh, packet. So in a publish uh, packet, as you can see, it's got the packet ID. Now, the thing is, too, if you're using a quality of service of zero, which means fire and forget, which means on the publisher side, I don't really worry about whether it gets uh, received or not. I just want to send it. So in that case, as you can see, the subscribe side, or, or actually the thing is, if you subscribe, if you publish to it, then you get back, you don't really get back an acknowledgement because you really don't care about it. Now, the thing is too, packet ID would be important if you're using QoS 1 or QoS 2 because it guarantees delivery of one uh, if it is like QoS level uh, two, or if you have QoS level one, which means at least deliver once, then I want to make sure that I get acknowledged. So that's, that's the uh, key of, of this packet ID. Now, all of these other uh, parameters would be the topic name, the QoS level, uh, retain flag and the payload, the actual messages, and is it a duplicate flag, right? And then there's also then on the subscribe side, um, you have your packet ID for subscribing to, and then you basically can chain it together in your subscribe subscription package or, or packet too, because as you can see, you can have different topics that are in the same subscriber packet um, essentially too. So so that's kind of a bit of a differences between the sub publish and the subscribe packet in this case. And now let's take a look then the next feature will be called last will. So as such, right, it's like human beings last will. It's more like, well, okay, my client would determine whether I want to have a last will. Meaning that if the client goes away, then the broker, right, broker is always there. For, remember that, right? It's guaranteed messaging. So broker will always send the messages, even if the client dies is what it is. It is a real push type of uh, kind of mechanism and is useful to implement some sort of on off mechanism in a safe way and basically you only send the messages when when subscribing to the topic too it's, it's basically the client's responsibility to indicate whether i want a last will so if the client goes away broker please take care of these messages so i might have specific messages that's called over here in the packet last will messages um just indicate something that oh i'm dead something right for example right so that's kind of just a way of kind of implement this on-off kind of guaranteeing messages delivery in a safe way. Okay, so let's go to the next one and we'll talk about retained message. So retained message is interesting. It's essentially the last known good value. So it will be stored on the broker side and client would decide if a message is retained or not. So essentially too, it retains means that after, you know, I subscribe, you know, to, to a messages, um, basically too, I don't want to, throw away the messages yet, right? So this way too, I want to make sure I received it. I want to indicate to the broker, also send to any future clients who are subscribed subscribe to this topic. So there's like specific um, kind of usages for this type of features too. So. Okay, so now then let's take a look into QoS, right? I talked kind of already about QoS level zero, one, and two. So these are for guaranteeing uh, delivery of messages. QoS zero means at most once delivery, fire and forget type. And then QoS one is at least once. So basically you can have duplicate messages too. Now in some cases you want actually QoS two because you want exactly once. 
no more and no less. You guarantee only once delivery, and you then you will use QoS two. But as you can see, the performance for QoS two will be a little bit higher because it re requires like a double handshake in order to guarantee it's only being delivered once. Okay, so here we go. Now let's take a look at QoS one um, or QoS zero. So this one is fire and forget. My packet ID comes in always zero in this case, the packet ID, because I don't really care about receiving any kind of acknowledgement. And so basically, too, once you publish it, it's up to the broker to decide what to do. Even if broker doesn't receive or acknowledge, the publisher doesn't really care as much in this case. Now, QoS 1 then is about delivery at least once. You know, you can have duplicate. So that's why there's only one handshake. It's more like publish. I publish it first, then I get back an acknowledgement. And that's all I need to know. If I get more, it's okay too. I don't refuse it, essentially. That's what QoS 1 is. Now, QoS 2 is the one that is more picky because I only want it once. So how is it being accomplished? Then you do need two sets of handshake. First of all, you want to publish it first. Now, the first time the broker gets it, instead of setting back an act right away, it, says, it sends back a pub rec. It's sort of like receive. Then I send back a packet ID. In this case, the, re the sender, or the client side will say, oh, okay, cool. You got it. Okay, one, uh, great. You know, and now I'm going to acknowledge that you acknowledge me. You know, you received me first. So I send back another pub rel. And then in this case, I set back, send back to the broker the same packet ID. And now the broker gets it and say, like, okay, very cool. You got it once, I will mark it down. So I, then I will send back a pub comp in order to indicate I completed it. So this way too, it guarantees that the, the messages is only being delivered only once, one and only once. So, but you can see too, this kind of like a double kind of uh, direction, right? The, or double kind of handshake will be a little bit uh, more perform, you know, increase the performance a little bit because of the extra uh, round trip. So, okay, so just now I talk about all of these kind of major features in MQTT3. So let's kind of take a look, you know, and, and I was talking about MQTT3 and then jump to MQTT5. So for those who are curious, you're wondering, where is MQTT4? So the reason is that if you take a look into talking about packages, right, or, or, or packet, message packet. So looking at the connect message packet detail for MQTT 3.1.1, as you can see, there's also a field called version. So the version actually is version 4 for MQTT 3.1.1. So when comes time, they designed the MQTT next generation, next version, they said, okay, now we're going to set the version to 5. And instead of naming the protocol um, version number uh, as four, logically it would be MQTT4. It says, you know what, let's kind of like, um, you know, pair it up so then it makes sense. You know, on the packet level is version five now. So let's name the, the um, specification uh, version number of this MQTT to also five. So that's, that's why. So again, it's for the, those who are curious about it. And now let's take a look then, go on to MQTT5, some key features. Uh, I'll go really, really quick on this one because I realize I'm talking for too long and uh, just wanted to kind of give you a very quick taste of it. It is essentially a successor of MQTT 3.1.1 and is non-backward compatible. First public release was made in January 2018 and the official release was March 2019. So it's like a relatively newer version too. And there are many new features. The features are mostly to support cloud native type of uh, environment too. And it's basically also add a lot of clarifications to the previous 3.1.1 features. Now, the goals, too, of such is to enhancements for scalability and large scale system. Again, you know, for the cloud native environment and error reporting has been greatly improved. And also there are formalized uh, some common patterns, including capability discovery and request response type of thing. And then there's also extensibility mechanisms, including like user properties, too. So you can kind of have configuration level of user properties that you can define, too. And overall, it's an open uh, performance improvement and support for smaller clients, too. 
So that's kind of like the thing. First feature I just wanted to point out is the session and message expiry. So this one, basically, if I to highlight it quickly, is basically um, is session expiry interval in seconds now. So broker expires session after the given interval as soon as the client disconnects. So it gives a bit more control over when the message is to expire. And then there are also user properties, as I mentioned about. These are for metadata kind of headers. Um, you can add it as part of uh, most uh, MQTT packets, right? For connection, for publish, and subscribe. These are all UTF-8 uh, encoded strings. And an unlimited number of user properties can be added as well. And then there's also this feature I just want to highlight is called shared subscription. Shared subscription is especially useful in a cluster type of environment. So it's really like for doing like cloud native type of scenario. You can have subscription, you know, like uh, publish and subscribe. You can have multiple, uh, many clients, but they all share the same subscription. The reason is that sometimes are you doing a cloud cluster, clustering environment, you can have multiple clients that are being defined for the same subscription. And they all kind of um, kind of work in a very coordinated fashion because at any one point given in time, you just want one client to actually be the active one, for example. So it's really for client low balancing kind of purpose. Multiple clients share the same subscription. And it's supported by HiveMQ for uh, MQTT 3.1 and 3.1.1. Um, so again, helps with upscaling and downscaling clients at runtime um, possible too. And uh, yeah, so it's not a uh, must kind of feature. But it's definitely for in today's world of cloud native of clustering, this actually becomes a very important feature too. Okay, so this is just an example to indicate, right? You have a share topic. You can have multiple clients um, within sharing the same uh, subscription. Uh, that's how we illustrate this here. Another feature is called request response. And these are essentially to sum up, it is actually a business level of acknowledgements that kind of gives the application layer a bit more control over the request response kind of sequences. So, okay. So I won't go into a, a lot of the details because I still want to spend like one minute just giving you an example. So MKDT in summary is lightweight and bandwidth efficient, right? And the control packet is actually very small. It's only a fixed header of two byte, right, over here, and up to 12 bytes of additional variable header. So these are variable size and present only when needed. So, and uh, so the, then, then you have the payload. So as you can see, Overhead is very extremely light. If you don't have any variable header, don't even give it. All you need is just two byte, like fixed byte. So very highly efficient. That's why it's catered really good for IoT type of scenario. Also, the data it carries is completely agnostic. You can have images, you can have JSON, you can have strings, you can have encrypted binary data, all of these things. So it's very, very flexible in terms of the data that it supports. And then another thing is about the continuous session awareness. I already talked about some of the features like retain the messages, last will messages, all of these is basically supporting a continuous session awareness, right? So if some kind of, you know, kind of session goes away, it's basically you, you keep track of all of these messages. So then they just don't get dropped essentially. So all of these uh, QoS level is supporting guaranteeing messages and all of these things. So, so it's highly relevant for doing IoT type of um, scenario, also over very unreliable network. And so that's kind of to sum up. And use cases for MQTT. So for MQTT, right, IoT first and foremost, and there's also industrial level of IoT, right? Industry 4.0, all of these are basically industry verticals, connecting cars, logistics, you know, manufacturing energy, you name it, right? And also on the consumer level, smart home, lifestyle, entertainment, all of these things. So is essentially MQTT's application can be limitless. So and there are also integration with other frameworks too. For example, now I work with Apache Pulsar. It also works with Apache Pulsar, a streaming platform. You basically, for example, Apache Kafka as well. So you can have MQTT essentially in the very front end, collecting all of the data from your many IoT devices that are scattered in a farm, for example, thousands of devices. You connecting, you know, so many devices, collecting all of these data, and it gets kind of all of these data can 
essentially you can build data pipelines that are talking to Kafka, for example, to Pulsar. Pulsar is another streaming platform that's kind of comparable in even more cloud native su support than Kafka. Um, so you, you can do that too and connect with these other frameworks and other MQTT brokers, you can chain them up and build data pipelines. For example, Eclipse Mosquito, that's the open source MQTT broker. Apache also has a, a project called Vern that's built on um, the uh, uh, Elixir kind of uh, platform, right? And then there are also runtimes too. If you're a Java person, it also works with Spring integration very well too. And alternative protocols to MQTT. I want to mention you can use HTTP, nobody is stopping you, but HTTP is a stateless protocol. Also too, it, it doesn't support so much of an asynchronous style of uh, kind of communication. So it doesn't scale as well. And then there's also constrained application protocol that actually runs on UDP rather than TCP IP. So um, it is it works, but it's a less of a reliable mechanism built in. And then there's also AMQP, for example, <clears throat> RabbitMQ supports that. So you can also use that as well. And then they're also on the industrial factory level, there's object linking embedding for process control, unified architecture or OPC UA. And then there's also data distribution service and as well as XMPP. XMPP, again, is an XML-based uh, extensible messaging and presence protocol that's um, essentially more catered for doing chat type of application. So these are some of the alternatives you can use for uh, supporting your IoT application uh, in terms of the protocol level. And basically, too, again, you know, with MQTT, with PubSub, it supports IoT on a very, very scalable kind of way, like 2.7 uh, millions of publishers per minute. Uh, how many, like 100,000 topics per subscription? All of these are very, very possible, right? And this is totally not a joke, right, that it can support, so. Okay, so I'll just take a very quick look at HiveMQ Cloud. I still, I do not work for them anymore, but I like to also kind of bring this up. I do believe it to be a quite a robust type of uh, MQTT broker. They have a uh, free version, but there's also like commercial version too. But if you go to the HiveMQ.com, you can kind of go over here. There's MQTT uh, tab. You go down all the way. There's a pub public MQTT broker that you can try out. So, and this is the, all of the statistics. If you want to actually try out the browser client, you can click on over here. And basically it gives you this, um, you know, if you quickly just wanted to try out, you can kind of, it already gives you the host name, the port number and the client ID. And all you can do, you don't even need a username password for testing purpose. You can just say connect. And once you connect, it shows you green is connected and you can publish. So let's say, hello, uh, Ber Berlin, buzzwords. Right. And you can publish. Oops. But then you're like, well, what happened? Guess what? Because we have been subscribed. So let's add a subscription to it and call it subscribe to test topic, whatever it is. A pound means a wild card. I can just do QoS2. I give it a color of red. Subscribe. So now uh, let's do it again. Hello, Berlin buzzwords. Let's publish it. Here we go. Now it goes very fast because there are other people doing so you can see, right? So, okay. So give that a try. If you haven't, you know, just play around with this. It's quite fun too. Okay. Let me kind of go back really quickly now. Please follow me. I have a Twitch stream every week. These days I've been talking all about streaming platform. I've been talking about Pulsar. Occasionally I bring up MQTT, all of these things too. So every Wednesday at 2 p.m. U.S. Central Time. And this is my link. And these are the resources for studying more about MQTT, the mqtt.org, and also the ebook from HiveMQ is very good. MQTT Essential Series, um, that's all very good. And the Oasis, if you're interested too, this is the link. With that, I want to thank you all. Thank you so much again for sitting through my talks and I appreciate this. And uh, please let me know, give me feedback, uh, connect with me over here. As you can see, I have a Discord channel. If you want to connect with me, I welcome anybody. Uh, if you want to have more technical discussions, if you have projects to share, I also have a community of folks that are really great uh, people. Uh, we're all interested in technology and wanting to continue talking about it. Uh, follow me on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn and uh, share with me your project. So thank you very much.